Yeah, one more time. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kelly Me. I'm the executive director of the RPS Social Science Division and one of the forum organizers. Welcome to our second ever hybrid climate adaptation forum. For those of you that don't know, the hardest kind of event to pull off is a hybrid event. So big thanks to the EDC staff and to the CDM staff that worked so hard to, to make this successful. Um, we've got about 75 people registered in person today and 135 on the virtual side of the event. So fantastic turnout. Everybody's excited to learn about nature based solutions. Um, a couple of housekeeping items for the folks in person. The mics that you see hanging from the ceiling, those are hot mics. Avoid confidential conversation. Um, we'll see what we can do to turn them off during the networking break. I'm not sure about that, but for now, let's keep that in mind. Um, we try really hard at the forum to make sure that this is a great experience for both in, uh, in person and virtual attendees. And so Mark Costa, one of our forum co-chairs today, will be managing um, questions from the virtual attendees and we'll go back and forth to make sure that we have an in-person question and a virtual question as long as we have plenty of questions on both sides. Our first hybrid event, which was back in June, was a smashing success. And today we decided to change the venue. And we're gonna have a few less staff, so please bear with us if we have a couple of technical technical issues. For those of you that haven't attended a forum today, we're now in our sixth year of quarterly programming. Um, so over the last six years, we've had a really diverse um, set of topics all related to climate resilience. All of the information about our previous forums is available online on our website. Um, our forum topics are guided by our steering committee. And they're a group of 15 committed professionals that help us pick the topics for each year of forums and also are responsible for co-chairing the event. Um, without their help, without the help of the steering committee, then we really we wouldn't be able to plot these forms. So if you're on the steering committee and in the room today, maybe just give a quick wave at the Aaron and Mark. We'll go around. Thank you. All you folks. Um, we are going to have a couple of open slots on our steering committee starting next year. Uh, so the nomination process for that will kick off in January. We'll release our call for nominations. So please do start thinking about your network or thinking about whether you yourself would be interested in nominating yourself, and you'll have a um, period of four or six weeks or so to submit a nomination. Um, we'll make those decisions and announce the new steering committee members in March. Um, let's see. Um, finally, I wanted to sort of end with a thank you. First and foremost, thank you to the EDC staff, to Jessamyn Cox, Jackson Bailey, Stephanie Sicker, and Ashley Gray. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do these events. So big thanks to everyone working so hard behind the scenes. Um, I also want to thank our forum co-chairs today. So we have Mark Costa, who is a water resources engineer with VHP, Melanie Garete, Director of Climate Engagement at the Civil Living Lab, and Nasser Rahim, Senior Coastal Resilience Specialist at Woodhull Group. Turn things over to Julie Eaton Earth from Weston Sampson to say a few words. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you all for joining today's forum this morning, whether you're there in person or virtual. Uh, Western and Samson is so proud to sponsor the Climate Adaptation Forum to support fostering connections across our industry and sharing innovation in this evolving and diverse field of climate adaptation. We're already experiencing the effects of climate change and mitigation is crucial, but adaptation is inevitable. And the Climate Adaptation Forum provides the opportunity for practitioners around the world to dive into important topics that can benefit our built, natural, and social environments, such as today's feature on nature-based solutions getting to scale. These hybrid forums take a lot of work to pull off successfully, as Kelly was mentioning. So I just want to thank you to all of our sponsors, uh, CDM Smith for hosting today's forum for those there in person, and the leadership at the Climate Adaptation Forum, EBC staff and the Sustainable Solutions Lab at UMass Boston for your dedication to making these forums accessible and successful. And I also wanna reiterate thanking the forum co-chairs and speakers for crafting a meaningful agenda and sharing their expertise, implementing nature-based solutions with us all this morning. So thank you very much for the opportunity to just make a few remarks. And I think I'll turn it over to the New England Aquarium. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Luzari Gosses, and I'm Director of Community Relations at the New England Aquarium. Um, we are thrilled to be a sponsor of this forum today, um, and we're really excited to be a partner of the entire series throughout the year. Um, I'm sure many, if not all of you, are familiar with the aquarium, probably through your childhood, some visits with your family to come see the animals. Um, but our hope is that even as adults, you continue to be engaged. Um, the New England Aquarium is a catalyst for global change through public, public engagement, commitment to marine animal conservation, leadership in education, innovative scientific research, and effective advocacy for vital and vibrant oceans. Um, and we're just over 50 years old, so we really have a lot of history over the aquarium, um, and we're thrilled to have forums like this that can talk about the future of our oceans and our communities. Um, so thank you so much for having us, and thank you to um, our fellow sponsors and the steering committee and our co-chairs who could put this event together. Okay, thanks very much, Julie and Luke. And I also want to extend a special thanks to Lauren Miller and CDM Smith, who stepped up and provided the venue for today's forum. So I'll let Lauren say a few words. Um, welcome to CDM Smith. Really happy to have you all here and enjoy our lovely space at 75 State Street on our 75th birthday. And I wanted to call out our buddy Jason behind us, who's making all this possible in our whole thing of facilities. Thank you. All right, let's get to the drill program and talk about nature based solutions. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so with that, I will welcome Melanie Garete to give today's program discussion. Hi, everybody. Thanks again for joining. I'm Melanie Garate. I'm the Director of Climate Engagement for the Still Living Lab, where we actually work on nature-based approaches to coastal climate resilience. So this topic is very fitting, and so nice to see some friendly faces in the audience and some friendly faces um, virtually. So thank you again for joining. Um, I'd like to begin by grounding us in the land acknowledgement. And so we are honoring the indigenous lands that we are occupying today in the greater Boston area. We recognize that we are the unceded lands of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Pawtucket tribes and any other tribes um, throughout history. These communities were here well before uh, these lands were colonized. They were here um, and worked in tandem with the environment in a reciprocal nature. Um, and we honor their past, current, and future history as they still reside on these lands today. And so we at the Climate Adaptation Forum encourage all of you to also look into the history, um, past and current history of your uh, indigenous territory. So thank you so much. And with that, I'd like to welcome our first speaker uh, on uh, nature-based approaches, who is joining us all the way from the West Coast in California. Um, so please give her um, um, much respect for waking up very, very early. <laughs> I know I woke up early to be here today. Um, she's waking up very early. So our first speaker is Heidi Nutters um, from the San Francisco Bay Estuary Partnership. Heidi Nutters, Senior Program Manager, leads climate resilience programming, including the, trans in including the Transforming Urban Water Initiative. Uh, her core focus areas include collaborative process, advancing on, ground, on the ground nature-based shoreline infrastructure projects, and integrating racial equity into the partnerships project. And so with that, um, I welcome Heidi Nutters. Hey, good morning. This is my first hybrid conference that I'm presenting at, so I'm very excited to be joining you all this morning. And I just wanted to acknowledge some of the staff that helped prepare the slides that I'll be presenting, including our director, Caitlin Sweeney, and some of the other stuff that were listed on the previous slide and acknowledge um, since I'm calling in from a different area than most of you are located, the um, traditional people, the indigenous people of the San Francisco Bay, including the many tribes of Ohlone, um, the Coast and Bay Miwok, Potwin, and Amamutsun tribal band, many of whom we are very grateful to partner with on many of the nature-based solution, um, solution projects that I'll be talking about in this presentation. Um, next slide. So I'm going to start, since um, I'm calling in from a different area, of just giving an overview of the San Francisco Estuary Partnership where I work and our blueprint, which guides a lot of the um, NBS, nature-based solutions um, work that I do. And then how we are getting to scale on NBS um, through local and regional initiatives in our area. Next slide. 
So the San Francisco Estuary Partnership is a place-based non-regulatory program of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, there are also NEPs on the East Coast. Um, and we are one of 28 members of the National Estuary Program, which was established by Congress in 1988 to protect and restore estuaries of national significance. Um, it's a model that focuses on local partnership, collaboration, and consensus building. Um, and we leverage funding and partnerships to support efforts to enhance and restore the estuary system, working with a diverse set of partners and with the estuary blueprint as our guiding document, which I will talk about in a minute. Next slide. Since I am in a different area, I just wanted to sort of ground this discussion in um, talking a little bit about the San Francisco estuary, which as I'm sure you all are aware is home to probably what's well known for is the four major cities that are located here, San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, and Sacramento, and many thriving um, communities of people living all over the Bay. Um, but it's less, less well known for um, the um, habitats and species that it also supports. The San Francisco estuary is the largest estuary in Western North America, and it's critical winter feeding habitat for migratory birds, a productive nursery for juvenile fish and shellfish, a year round home for a vast diversity of plants and animals, and half of California's surface water supply falls um, within this region. So we really look at the interface of water and species and habitats um, as being really interconnected for our, for our area. Next slide. So the estuary blueprint, which I mentioned, is a non-regulatory regional collaborative um, planning document required by the Clean Water Act. Um, it was initially released in 1993 and served as the first collaborative plan for the estuary developed by over 100 stakeholder groups, many of whom had never sat down at the table together to agree on priorities. Um, it has undergone several updates since then. Um, the most recent one being released this year in July. So we're really proud and excited of um, this new iteration of the blueprint, which um, guides a, a all of my work on nature-based solutions. Next slide. So the current um, version of the blueprint is both a regional vision, asking ourselves where we wanna be in 2050 and an actionable strategy for what we can do over the next five years to get there. Um, it's a roadmap for the health of the estuary, addressing its chemical, physical, biological, and social ecological processes. Next slide. Um, this very busy slide <laughs> represents in shorthand all of the 22 estuary blueprint actions, just so you can see the breadth of the topics covered here. And for me, when I'm thinking about nature-based solutions, I'm really thinking across this broad swath of topic areas and trying to develop solutions with nature that are contextualized through engagement with communities and tribes on the ground. So. Um, our work does really on NBS really does touch on all of these topics, su on a subset of these topics within local communities, but it, you know, all of this is connected to NBS. Next slide. So how does all of these overarching themes come together for action? Um, I'm going to dig into climate resilience as a good example. Um, clearly, climate change is a high priority for our region, um, and the blueprint um, prioritizes climate resilience. So for the estuary partnership, we consider in the context of protecting and restoring our natural resources, knowing that the resilience of the estuary and the resilience of surrounding communities are codependent and, and interconnected. So the blueprint focuses specifically on identifying ways to protect and restore natural resources, such as um, tidal marshes as an integral part of any effort to increase the resilience of shoreline communities at risk of flooding and rising seas. Um, it also focuses on increasing the pace and scale of climate adaptation projects that utilize nature-based strategies by um, tackling challenges such as funding and regulatory challenges, which I'll get into. And it helps facilitate implementation of um, innovative strategies that can provide multiple benefits such as flood protection, improved water quality, habitat, and open space. Next slide. So that's sort of the overlay of the work that I do on NBS. And now I'm gonna dive into um, some 
sort of specifics around some of the key questions that we're asking in our region. Uh, a pilot project that I work on. Um, there are many more, but I didn't want to um, overwhelm you with places around the Bay. Um, and then also some regional initiatives that we're working on to address um, barriers to implementation. Next slide. So these are really the key questions that I'm focused on at the Estuary Partnership with our staff and with our partners. First is, you know, how can nature-based solutions help us to address multiple complex problems at once? And some of the major ones are listed here. So the first is the complex water management for the San Francisco estuary, which is really about the way that changes in water use are happening with the need to dispose of things like reverse osmosis concentrate, which is a byproduct of desal here in the and that we use are trying to increase the use of, as well as aging water infrastructure and changing water demand with increased precipitation um, and rising seas, all affecting um, water infrastructure, wastewater treatment in particular, that's often located right at the bay, um, the bay shore. Second is community-led adaptation to climate change. So as I said, really working with communities to develop solutions and also to understand how we can improve design through monitoring and evaluation. Um, the next is about how do we support innovation in design and engineering, stakeholder engagement and solutions. You know, a lot of our infrastructure, the traditional gray infrastructure is not necessarily built for innovation. It's, it's built to be reliable. Um, and so the agencies that, you know, um, are responsible for protecting that infrastructure are not always designed for innovative projects, which many NBS projects are. They're new, they're new formats, they're new designs. And so how do we support that change process for innovation within our government agencies that are responsible for this infrastructure? And how can we address those barriers to um, innovation together? Next slide. So one um, project that we um, have here in, our, in the Bay is the Oraloma Living Laboratory, also called the Oraloma Horizontal Levy. This project is located in San Lorenzo, California. So that's the East Bay, south of Oakland. And it's a proof of concept design that was built in 2018. Um, and it was really the brainchild of several incredible people in the Bay, including Peter Bay, a botanist, and Jeremy Lowe, coastal um, geomorphologist. Um, and the idea behind the horizontal levee is that you can provide flood protection through a natural system while also treating wastewater within that system. So utilizing beneficial reuse of treated wastewater, which then um, is um, removes contaminants through microbial below ground processes. Um, the freshwater input can also increase the plant growth and improve success of restoration just by having water at the site. And the brackish marshes can build organic soils and help um, keep pace with sea level rise. Um, we are doing this work in partnership with um, David Sedlak's lab at UC Berkeley and also um, the Silicon Valley um, uh, Water Agency, which is called Valley Water. Next slide. Um, so these are a couple of pictures of the site, including down in the corner there, the bunch of volunteers from Save the Bay um, who did all the planting at our site. Um, now all this vegetation is well over 20 feet <laughs> with the willows that have, are thriving in, our, in the site. Um, so just some of the key findings, and um, I can put in the chat um, a, a whole list of publications that have been um, developed from the site. Um, first is that horizontal levees have incredible potential to improve water quality. So the, the water that is treated at the site can remove nutrients, um, including complete removal of nitrogen um, that we've seen um, with uh, secondary treated wastewater. Um, and contaminants of, removing, of emerging concern. Um, we've in particular studied um, removal of pharmaceuticals at the, uh, in the wastewater. Um, as I also said, we're, we're um, treating reverse osmosis concentrate, which is a byproduct of, of desal, as I mentioned, and seeing really great results and are also currently looking at um, turning the site on and off with different water sources. So moving between treated wastewater, reverse osmosis concentrate and stormwater. 
Um, there are also some limitations to the design, in particular, the capacity of the site to just receive the sheer amount of water that we need to treat it to really get to scale. And we're working hard on that. Um, it's a comp more complex regulatory process um, and a more complex planning process. So how do we build best practices for that along the way? And we have several emerging pilot projects that I, I mentioned that are focused more on consultation with tribes, um, working with communities to um, develop monitoring and evaluation programs that are really driven by what do they want to measure at the site and then going out and measuring it. Um, so really developing those performance metrics with communities and also balancing habitat and public access, um, which can sometimes be at odds in projects like this that are right on the shoreline. Next slide. Another um, project we work on, it's called the Transforming Shorelines Collaborative. And this is really focused on the fact that these, as I said, these projects are innovative, they're new for the region, and it's risky for local governments to take them on. And so, you know, how do we provide cover and work together on advancing these projects? So we don't do it alone. We, we do it um, as part of a collaborative process. So this collaborative brings together practitioners and experts on nature-based solutions, regulators, engineers, designers, scientists, community-based um, organizations, and we use um, an expert consultation model where people will bring individual projects that they're developing or specific topics, and we'll do a deep dive into them, really looking at what are some of the barriers to this project moving forward? How could we address that through a collaborative process? Um, and listed here are um, the topics we've already covered and, and a couple that will be coming up this year. Um, so this has been a, a great way for us to see these projects advance. And like I said, we don't have best practices always for what is the best path through the challenges we're seeing at the site. So we do that together and we've found that that really helps um, to um, see these projects through. Next slide. We're also working, um, as I mentioned, on addressing regulatory pathways, um, permitting complexity, is truly one of the largest hurdles to successful implementation of these projects in, in the San Francisco Estuary and Bay. Um, it's, it's really about the, the fact that these projects are new and regulatory agencies don't always have a context um, and for how to address um, the permitting needs. Um, and they're so variable from one agency to the next. So our solution is really to work with our regulatory and land management partners to develop solutions. Um, we're currently working with uh, our a consultant, Environmental Science Associates, to develop a series of case studies from existing projects, really looking at where did those projects get stuck in the permitting process and what are some pathways through that. So we're really focused on looking at mitigation um, issues, this, this question of um, changing water sources within um, a living levy or horizontal levy project, and um, a few other questions as well. And that's a project that's currently ongoing, um, intended to wrap up next year. Next slide. And this is my last slide. Um, another piece that I wanted to talk about is working with um, communities and tribes and really leading with um, a racial justice lens and the work that we do. Um, this picture is from a um, community-based visioning process that we did in the community of North Richmond in the East Bay. Um, and this was really about working, you know, with communities going out to the shoreline, these, uh, what they're looking at is a board that was in English and in Spanish, asking them, what are you using the shoreline for currently? And what would you like to see on the shoreline? And out of that visioning process, we're seeing several projects that are being developed now that are, you know, directly being called for by communities. So I just want to emphasize that we really see there's no wrong time to engage communities in the process. We've done it at the visioning stage during design. Um, we're looking at um, d d having community-based monitors and tribal liaisons to monitor construction. And then also post-construction monitoring, really looking at how to, again, like I said, improve these projects moving forward. Um, 
So next, I think my, the last slide is just a thank you slide, um, but this is our staff all masked up. And I wanna, as I said, mention um, and appreciate them all for helping me prepare these slides, which really touches on several areas of work that we do. Um, and thank you all, as I said, for um, being able to present here in San Francisco where it's still dark out <laughs> and I'm happy to take any questions. Amazing, thank you so much for sharing that. If you didn't hear that, they're copying for you. Um, great, and so I will take us off with some questions. I'm looking to see if there are any hands raised right now. Okay, I see one in the back. Um, yes, I think if you can speak loudly, uh, I can also repeat your question to make sure that the virtual audience can hear. I was wondering if she could talk more about uh, the challenges of balancing habitat with public access and making sure that there are benefits to the public. Okay, yes. Could you talk more about balancing um, habitat and public access? Yeah, definitely. So um, one project in particular that um, was mentioned on one of the slides is um, in the city of Palo Alto. And there, um, you know, we have the our Bay Conservation and Development Commission, which, you know, requires um, in, that we ensure public access, which obviously is a priority for us as well. Um, but we need to make sure that that access is not located so close to sensitive species um, or sensitive habitats that it would um, compromise them. And, you know, every square foot of our bay is, you know, important to community groups. And, you know, some of these projects are large in size, but some of them are quite small because we're talking about, you know, um, a highly urbanized estuary. So we do that through engagement. So we had a, a workshop with stakeholders at that location that was focused on, you know, sharing space and how do we balance the needs for public access um, with the needs to protect sensitive species and really just ongoing conversation with community members and then taking that back to our design team and sort of iterating from there. So I don't, there's no, um, I don't I don't have a perfect answer because it's something we're definitely still grappling with, but it's really just about balancing all of those perspectives. Thank you. I know we're all working on making sure community engagement is done well. We're gonna take one question um, from the chat and then we'll come back to, to the audience. So this is from Tom McGuire, who asked, how long has the monitoring been occurring? And are there any results available? Yeah, so how long has the monitoring been um, happening and is that available at all, the data? Um, we, this is all new. So the, the monitoring and evaluation, for example, at Palo Alto, we're still in development of that. So we're working with a local community-based organization called Nuestra Casa, which is in East Palo Alto. Um, and they'll be leading the process, um, working with, um, scientists at, um, um, U.S. Geological Survey. Um, and also um, California State University. Um, they've really identified an interest in studying microplastics and also metals at the site. Um, so I think that's probably the direction that we're going to take. Um, so I could I can come back to you um, probably next year and let you know how it goes. But right now we're in the process of really just trying to align priorities, what, what their interests are at the site with um, the right scientists that can help design a study that um, is accessible and can be, you know, where the data can be collected out in the field by community members. So, you know, that's a different step than is often taken where, you know, you, you have trained scientists that can go out by boat or, you know, use equipment that's pretty complicated to, to utilize. So right now we're just at that stage of the study where we're trying to figure out the logistics of that to make it accessible for community members. So do you plan to have that publicly available in the future? Or is that the, the data? Today? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All righty. So back to the in-person audience. Go ahead. Yeah. My question is, do you have enough state regulators to, to manage this type of work, especially if it's going to be growing? And you mentioned that you wanted to innovate on the regulatory permit process. So have they formed a formal working group to improve permitting? 
Oh. Wayne Cobley, GZA, Geo Environmental. Were you able to hear that, Heidi? Yes, I did. Thank you. That's great. Well, we're lucky to have really um, amazing partnerships with our regulators. Um, so in the Bay, there's a group called the Bay Restoration Regulatory Integration Team, which includes members of every single regulatory agency that permits, um, you know, multi-benefit habitat restoration projects. And they do consultation on projects together. So you basically come to them. You can, the idea is early consultation. So as early as 30% design, you can come to the BRIT as they're called, um, present on your project and be given feedback by every single regulatory agency. Um, and, you know, for the, the projects that I'm talking about here, usually we're consulting with the BRIT, you know, four or five, six times during between you know the initial design of the project and applying for permits. Um, so that has been amazing um, forum for us to get early feedback to address that through the Transforming Shorelines Collaborative. We can bring the Brit fit feedback and talk it through, develop the studies that are needed. Um, and are there, I think you asked if there's, you know, enough regulators. And I think the regulatory agencies are incredibly understaffed. Um, and so this is this is a big ask on every side, you know, um, as I'm sure you guys are experiencing in your area as well. So um, they are very busy. They have their hands full, um, but we do appreciate that they're at the table and, and talking through these challenges together. Great, thank you. And I think one more question from the chat. Yeah, so this is from Julie Wormser. Um, Hi, Julie. <laughs> Where does your funding and governance capacity come from to hold this good work together? Is it all voluntary or are there registrations, sorry, excuse me, regulations that help you stay together? Okay, so where are your fun where does your funding come from and how do you keep everybody together? Yeah, so um we have several this this the work that I mentioned and I, I was remiss in not listing all of our funders um, comes from multiple funders. Um, the largest one being the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, um, who as, also funds the National Estuary Program. Um, we also have funding from state sources, including the State Coastal Conservancy and the Department of Water Resources, um, who funded the Oroloma project. Um, we have funding from local government. So the Palo Alto horizontal levy um, is also funded by the city of Palo Alto. And so we really manage our grants pretty programmatically so that we can kind of leverage like, you know, what that particular grant is asking for and basically have built this program by, you know, stacking one grant on top of the other in, in order to do this. Um, is it all voluntary or their regulations? What we have in the Bay is a lot of guidance on adaptation. So we have amazing documents like the Adaptation Atlas that help us, you know, set landscape level priorities for adaptation that then we can implement at the local scale, knowing that this one project is not a little postage stamp on its own, but connected to a larger system um, and a larger plan. So we utilize that planning context, I think. Um, more than regulate, like not, nothing is compelling us from a legal perspective, but more from, you know, this strong call from our region and incredible urgency to address adaptation. Thank you so much. Let's see if we have time for one more question from the audience, maybe from this side of the room. Oh, yeah. I was curious about the first project um, you mentioned and you uh, talked about three different uh, sources for water quality treatment, reverse or types of uh, treatment, reverse osmosis, um, I think wastewater and stormwater, if I recall. I was wondering how, how that is all happening in the same facility, or is it different pilots using different sources of contaminated water? Um, exactly how, how is that being operationalized? Yeah, so, and I will put in the chat the link to our- Sorry, sorry. Sure, I'm Pallavi Mande from Samra Prani. And my other question follow-up is, uh, if you could also talk about that, uh, the nitrogen treatment that you said has been very effective. Has that kind of 
happen for all three of those uh, treatment systems or uh, how, let's, how, let's try to tackle yeah. the first question yeah. and then um, we may have to move on. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. I just put in the chat the link to the our website for that project, which links to almost, there was one other publication that recently came out, but all of the other sort of peer-reviewed journal articles um, that have been published on this particular site that really go into some of the details on um, nitrate removal, um, you know, pharmaceuticals and, and other things. But just going to the question of um, changing water sources at the site, um, as, as I said, this is really a living laboratory. So there are 12 treatment cells that were built into the site. Um, when it was originally built, um, we were utilizing treated wastewater across all of the treatment cells with different combinations of um, soil types and plant vegetation types. Um, above ground. And recently, like what we're doing right now um, as we speak is reconfiguring some of those cells to, um, to receive other types of, of water inputs. And in particular, the reverse osmosis concentrate, which is being like trucked to the site on a weekly basis from Silicon Valley, as I mentioned. Um, so this is an area of very active study. Um, there's, you know, preliminary monitoring results on ROC in particular. Um, and the question about stormwater is one that we're just starting to ask. You know, we're asking it of our regulatory partners. We're seeing the call for it from local projects that, you know, think this would be ideal for their site, but we haven't tested it yet at the regulatory level of, can we even permit a project like that? Um, so it's something that we're having an ongoing conversation about with with the regulators and with scientists um, to see how the, how we would do that. So that's kind of a leading edge of the work that we're doing here in the Bay. But the the website that I um, shared, you know, has pictures and a lot more information about the project. And I'm I'm happy and if anybody wants to reach out, I'm happy to direct them to more resources as well. Amazing. Thank you so much, Heidi. And if there's anything else that you'd like to share, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll be sharing everything after the Climate Adaptation Forum is over. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, who is also joining us virtually, I believe from New York. Um, she is Pippa from SCAPE Studio. Pippa is a resilience principal at SCAPE. She's a leading national expert on resilience planning and design for climate adaptation. Pippa works with multi-disciplinary teams to develop landscape strategies and next century infrastructure that integrate environmental, economic, and social benefits. Um, she leads a lot of work, including um, the Oyster Living Breakwater Zillion Oyster Project. I'm very excited to um, hear from her today. So I'll pass it over to you, Pippa. Hi, yeah, um, I think someone's gonna, yeah, so I am, um, I do a lot, but landscape is a landscape architecture and planning practice. We're based in um, New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco. So um, Heidi was great. It's always so great to hear everything that's happening in the Bay Area. I think that my presentation will kind of deal with and think about many of the same challenges and opportunities that Heidi spoke of, but at the scale of a, a single uh, single project. Um, and <clears throat> our practice, we really focus on, um, on nature-based infrastructure on land and in water and integrating human experience um, and quality of life along with ecosystem services and landscape systems. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about our Living Breakwaters Project, um, which is uh, a project located off the south shore of Staten Island. It's the southern tip of New York City. And really talk, I want to ground it a little bit in the origin and vision of the project, the design and what went into designing, but also making sure it could be permitted and implemented, um, and a, a little step of making it a reality. We went into construction last year on what is a, a relatively large scale. We still think of it some Sometimes as a pilot, it's new, but this is um, you know over a mile and a half of shoreline and 3,000 plus linear feet of breakwaters. Um, next, so it, I would be remiss if I didn't kind of talk about the origin of this, and I think it it really is the grounding for the opportunity in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, which is really devastating for New York City. Um, there was a lot of rebuilding and efforts, um, one of which was the rebuild by design competition, um, which was unique in that. And you can jump to the next slide. 
um, it called for, it was not something that went out and said, oh, we need, um, you know, here's a site, here's a project, we need to restore this back. It said it called for design-led interdisciplinary teams, and this is our team, um, next slide, to engage in a process that um, the, the then leader, who is a, a actually a Dutch government official who was on loan uh, to, to then HUD Secretary Sean Donovan, um, Hank Ovink, described as a sabbatical detour from the normal way of doing Doing things. Um, and it, if any of you have, you know, received or managed FEMA or, or Housing and Urban Development, CDBGDR block grants, like this is true. <laughs> the idea of sort of setting this process up um, and, and getting teams on board without kind of knowing exactly what you're doing and what the money would be used for is, is definitely different. And I, I highlight this because I do think it was part of what enabled um, the community informed and uh, interdisciplinary and iterative design and analysis process. So next slide. Um, our team in here, and you can jump, just jump right to the next slide, really started from a um, uh, this idea of looking at combining risk reduction on exposed shorelines to enhancing nearshore degraded ecosystems and really improving quality of life day to day as well as resilience from these sort of storm events of waterfront communities um, and acknowledge that you know not every community was the sort of dense lower Manhattan and a wall to wall off the water wasn't going to be appropriate to every community. Um, the, the harbor for a place like New York and New Jersey, much like in Boston, you know, is, is part of our identity, our economy, our history, if not for New York Harbor, not for New York City. Um, walling out the water wouldn't work everywhere. Next slide. So this was an extensive process. I could do a whole presentation on that alone, but the outcome for our team was um, the proposal for the Living Breakwaters Project, which really combined those ideas as a necklace of breakwaters. Um, next slide. Um, breakwaters that were living breakwaters um, that really were aimed not only around risk reduction, but for habitat um, enhancement. Um, and this idea of this nature-based infrastructure that was designed to kind of restore some of the ecosystem services historically present in Raritan Bay and Lower New York Harbor. Um, next slide. Um, and this was part of the process in talking about everything that these things did, but very clear from the beginning, from this competition phase, that they do not keep the water out. And I think this is really important messaging and transparency around a lot of nature-based infrastructure because they provide huge benefits and many more co-benefits than other infrastructure, but they work differently. Um, and we need to be clear and transparent about that. Next slide. Um, so based on this proposal, HUD awarded the state of New York, um, not, not SCAPE, not us, but the state of New York. And a really another big point to make is that partnership and collaboration with the governor's office of storm recovery, who has led and managed and is implementing this project has been key. And their competence and collaboration and commitment um, to the aspirations of the project um, has been critical in moving it forward. So next slide. So we were able to, um, that award was in 2014, but we were fortunate to be engaged by the governor's office of storm recovery to start design. But you can see that design did not start until 2021. So, um, you know, this is, I wanna quickly run through some of the highlights from that process to illustrate and explain some of the process and analysis that went into delivering um, is sort of large scale nature-based infrastructure um, and, and the rigor of the analysis that it requires to get through through permitting and community confidence in something that is new and innovative. Next slide. So uh, again, these sort of three themes that run through of, of co of co benefits of reducing coastal risk, enhancing ecosystems, and fostering social resilience. Next slide. First and foremost, first but not foremost, um, just one of the key things is reducing risk, and this is often the you know the only focus of these, but. The rationale here, next slide, is that in this area, Sandy caused extensive damage and even loss of life in Tottenville. Um, the damaging waves from Sandy, just, you know, the first line of buildings that was a home was re were really the breakwaters during Sandy. Um, they obliterated buildings, um, destroyed them. Tragically, a, a father and daughter were actually washed out to sea. And so, you know, flooding was an issue, but the real big issue of damage, death, and um, 
and debris here was waves and water velocity. Um, what we also discovered in talking with the communities and looking at historic information was this, this shoreline has experienced dramatic long-term erosion. Next slide. Um, and this is really um, largely due to the site's context um, across from the New York Bight that really funneled waves during Sandy, but has continued to funnel waves directly at the South Shore. So this gives you a little bit of context. You can see the shape of Manhattan. This is the southern tip of the city and really exposed. Next slide. Um, and this res resulted in really dramatically higher erosion rates as well. That's the red as well as wave attack um, during Sandy. Next slide. So, um, you know, one of the things that used to historically buffer this shoreline were historic oyster reefs, but we can't sort of put miles and miles and acres of oyster reefs in this um, back. And so how do we find something that breaks these storm waves and living break breakwaters work, like they say, they break waves. Next slide. Um, but in addition to breaking those big storm waves, they do uh, attenuate day-to-day -day waves and start to capture sediment and help build the shoreline back. Um, and that was one of the things. But, but next slide, we couldn't just conceptually this worked, but we in design, we had to say that this worked in this very particular physical and hydrodynamic context, the context of the water movement. And so we're really looking at and modeling different configurations and shapes of breakwaters to make sure it worked. Next slide. And this was an intense collaboration with our engineering and modeling partners. Our CADIS engineers did all of the hydrodynamic uh, computer modeling and our coastal engineering and design of the breakwaters was done in collaboration with COE engineers. And so wave modeling, like this is many models, but even the wave modeling alone wasn't one model. You know, we kind of understood the conditions and were able to can basically configure them, but then we had a quick model to model them. And then we had a more in-depth model as we got to final design that took like a day and a half to a day to run. Um, so we could really understand and make sure that they were working. Next slide. And we had to show those models, you know, to the permitting agencies, to the client and make sure that, you know, this was going to do what we said. Shoreline change is completely different. So this is a 2D Genesis shoreline change model. And you can see there's a lot, we did a lot of these. We had done 19 by the time we got to 60% design that this was really an iterative process to test and make sure these configurations we're designing the shoreline that we want because um, we're not directly doing something you're engaging with that system and change next slide so um, the other thing was just uh, physical modeling so this this is a giant wave tank where we built 20 scale models of these breakwaters to test that the coastal design the engineering of these breakwaters were going to be uh, um, physically robust and they weren't going to deteriorate or get damaged in these different events. So next slide. Um, but it isn't just about risk reduction. So we had to think about that structural stability, the ability to reduce waves, but also be designed to create habitat. And this happened really um, hand, uh, hand in hand. Um, and the inspiration we really bring to aimed to um, bring that same level of scientific rigor to how we design for a variety of species that would inhabit the breakwater. They're often billed as oyster reefs. These are not oyster reefs. They're not restored oyster reefs, but they are designed to restore or revive the ecosystem services that oyster reefs that were historically here provided. And those reefs dampened wave energy, but they also um, historically supported a variety of other species through the complex structured habitat that reefs surprise. Uh, that reefs supplied. Next slide. We like to talk about these oysters as habitat forming species. Um, and so, you know, one of the questions while we are inspired and informed by oysters, we were really designing for a whole host of other species at different stages of their life cycle. And like any good designer, you ask like, what does my client need? What do my stakeholders need? How are people gonna use this? In this case, we were asking how fish and crabs and lobsters and benthic invertebrates are gonna use this. Next slide. And so we looked to create really healthy habitats. Um, one of the key things, um, you know, we're looking to create a healthy biodiverse ecosystem um, as well. We've identified a series of target species and habitats, one of the key ones being juvenile fish. Um, next slide, because in the lower estuary, um, this is a really important spot for migratory fish, but there's all these different um, types of fish that use the, and other aquatic species that would use the lower estuary in different ways. And so we work with our, our um, ecologists, CARC Ecological Consulting, as well as the environmental consultants, AKRF, to integrate the environmental studies and really understand how these creatures were using the bay now and what they needed. Um, and next slide. Um, 
you know, these target species were informed by those um, teams aquatic surveys, but also re regional restoration priorities, such as those laid out in the um, Hudson Estuary Comprehensive Restoration Plan, which is our regional restoration priority. So there's things like um, habitat for fish, crab, and lobsters, shallow near shore waters. We're really looking at those restoration priorities and incorporating them into the design. Next slide. Um, so what does that mean for our design? More than anything, that means um, first and foremost is about creating complexity, which we did in many ways and at many scales. Um, really thinking about niches and crevices for modal organisms like fish, you know, the breakwaters being rubble mound structures constructed of rocks that leave these gaps between was a really key part of this. So um, next slide. We also designed in more macro features, what we like to call reef ridges. And these are conceptual diagrams on the left that kind of created more surface area and created places for forage and refuge. But they were, they were designed on, um, modeled after naturally occurring spur and groove formations. But we also did a lot of modeling of these to understand that the way the, the water velocity and sediment dynamics were gonna support the type of habitats that we were interested in here. Next slide. Um, we also introduced some special materials. So nat rocks, um, natural rock was great, but we also um, worked to develop these ecological concrete armor units and tide pools um, to add additional um, surface complexity and attract um, species. Next slide. Um, so these are all aimed to kind of support, this is a rendering of what we were hoping for, and I'll show some pictures of what it's starting to look like now later, but like to create this diverse uh, habitat, this diverse ecosystem, not just targeted at one thing. Next slide. Um, and so again, like I said, these are not oyster reefs, but oysters will be an important component of the breakwater because they are the habitat forming species. Um, there'll be active oyster restoration on the breakwaters by the Billion Oyster Project. Um, and many folks were skeptical about the feasibility of oyster growth in the lower harbor, even though um, the folks at Rutgers had done some suitability analysis said it was great. But what the Billion Oyster Project has been doing is doing these pilot installs of some of the techniques that have um, been here and uh, might colleague Danielle right there on the left is holding this thing that looks like a big glob of oysters. That's like one season of growth on um, a little installation of some of that ecological concrete. So we're testing, piloting, monitoring, and proving some of those techniques to build confidence. Um, next slide. So, but again, the other piece of this, and um, I think this is really you know, the, just such a benefit of the Billion Oyster Project's contribution is around social resilience, in this case, engagement, education, and stewardship. Next slide. Um, so, you know, this involved through the project, extensive outreach and engagement in the design process, but this was not and is not intended to be everything that it's about. Next slide. It's really about a longer term or active and sustained effort for education and stewardship um, around Raritan Bay and the harbor, um, particularly engagement of Staten Island schools. And this was really a foundation of the project from the beginning and a vision at the outset. Next slide. But it's also actually been implemented through our partnership with the Billion Oyster Project. And I want to cite that that education, this is not just asking for volunteers, that education and their efforts have been actively funded and supported as part of the project um, by the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. And it will be part of the ongoing um, work of the project. So um, this is kind of presenting some of the restoration component at a workshop. Next slide. Um, and, you know, it meant, uh, you can jump to the next slide. This meant like getting out into the classrooms um, and, and talking about the project. Next slide. But also um, really getting the students out into the harbor. Um, and part of Billion Oyster Project's program, they do restoration that I showed, but they also do education. They're actually designing curriculum and training teachers to use the harbor, the ecosystems of the harbor, um, to teach um, science, to teach about food webs, ecosystems, so that students in New York City are learning about nature that's in their backyard and not some um, hypothetical uh, habitat or ecosystem. Next slide. And this has really been a process. I have students come up to me and tell me information about the breakwaters that they know that I've forgotten. Um, these are some students presenting at some of their work and research at one of our um, workshops. So this also, next slide, resulted in an online STEM curriculum. You can access it, use it if you want, but it was actually this uh, fortuitously launched right before the pandemic, um, which was a really great element that the breakwaters will be used. And then when they're built, really able to be used as an active piece. So throughout all this, I really cannot emphasize how much, next slide, um, 
it takes a team, a village, everyone, and I, I left a note on here, I forgot to add the construction team that's now working on it. I'm not gonna be able to um, like mention and emphasize everyone, but like Heidi said, this is just, it takes so many people and so much collaboration. Um, so I'll just wrap up with where we are now and what the implementation is. Next slide. Um, so finally, you can just jump to the next slide. We are at construction. But before I show you construction photos, I'm going to show you these binders because um, regulation has come up. And I, you know, all that analysis and everything I said, this is our environmental impact statement. Six binders. I think it's like two feet wide. Um, uh, you know, I gave you the the skim off the top. It it we had to really show our work um, as you know when it's new and it's different. You've really got to communicate that, um, and it is about that. Um, next slide, um, and and that's just so critical. And I think one of the foundation things that I foundational things that I want to communicate to all designers and all practitioners is translate your design objectives into your purpose and need. Um, one of the things that we often find is that like we get this purpose and need of risk reduction projects, and then they say, and then we're going to get these co-benefits if we can. No, no, they are the fundamental component of the project, and that was really critical in sustaining and maintaining the ecological and habitat enhancing as well as social resilience elements of the project. Uh, next slide. Um, and a key part of it being there. Um, people often ask us about mitigation. Um, I can answer some questions about this, but the project does have mitigation. Um, but we were we are actually not required to mitigate for the pieces that are displaced underwater where we are transforming uh, habitat. We are required to mitigate for those external and emergent parts of the breakwater. Um, and, and, and that was a long discussion and negotiation process. Um, next slide. So, um, it's also not cheap. Um, just, you know, okay, uh, it's also not cheap. Next slide. But I think if you think about the cost relative to um, relative to it being three types of projects and stop one, it's actually cost effective. So we are uh, almost complete with four breakwaters with two to go. Next slide. Um, and you can just kind of flip through these. Construction is taking place across many locations. These are the two types of breakwaters we have. Um, and we're building construction. So these are the base layers, these marine mattresses that support the base the breakwaters. They are clad in armor stone that's quarried from upstate New York. And this is not riprap. Uh, this is carefully selected and placed stone. Uh, these are the ecological e-concrete armor units that I mentioned that go in and are interspersed in a much smaller density with the stone. Next slide. Um, and these are all getting placed. So this is the placement of the rocks one by one with this large e-crane and this little picture of the hub. It actually has a GPS unit to place those rocks in the right place. Next slide. And similarly, the armor units um, and tide pools that we see are placed like this. Um, next slide. These are then um, adjusted in place to ensure interlock. Again, this is not riprap. Each one of these stones are placed and adjusted individually to make sure that they interlock. Um, these are my three-year-old daughter's favorite part of the project. They are amphibious excavators. They float. <laughs> um, but this has involved a lot of oversight and inspection. Um, we have a construction management team led by Baird um, with Ramble um, that um, that are, uh, will, are out there all the time. And we periodically go just to oversight and talk with the contractors. But we're really seeing these start to take shape and, next slide, come to life. Um, I think this is some of the most exciting things is that, you know, we're still in active construction and we're seeing use by birds, by things and our friendly local harbor seal, who the contractors have named Stanley. Um, next slide. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and people are out there seeing it. You can really see this happening from shore. Um, and it's, it's, it's been very exciting. Um, uh, next slide, we're wrapping up construction by 2024. Um, quickly, the oyster restoration piece will happen once the physical structure of the breakwaters are complete. These are the oysters, these are the breakwaters that will receive oyster restoration. And the next couple slides, you can just flip through to speak to the different types of installation. So these discs, these shell on mesh that go into those units, as well as oyster gabions placed around the breakwaters. So, sorry, I had a lot, a lot of slides I tried to cover, but I hope that gives you an overview and touches on some of the kind of questions and points and applicability to other projects. Thank you so much for that. Um, at the Marine Biologist and Fellow uh, Oyster Lover, really appreciated your presentation. I think we have time for just one question before moving on to the speaker. So, yes, right here in back. And if you can say your name and your affiliation. Yeah, 
I'm a here. I'm with CDM Samantha Host. Uh, I'm interested in once the project is implemented, is are you guys like kind of following up and keeping monitoring and evaluating? The, the question is around what does maintenance look like? Yes. Yeah. Break. Break. Um, uh, the, once completed construction, the project will be turned over to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and there is a maintenance and monitoring plan. Um, there's more intense monitoring for the first five years and periodic monitoring over the next 20, and all the maintenance is really in uh, adaptive management. Our analysis of breakwater projects are, are that they are relatively low maintenance, and that was one of the considerations and driving factors um, in you know, in creating things because that federal funding doesn't come with a maintenance budget attached. So we wanted to make sure that agencies could you know, maintain and operate these over time. Great, thank you. I apologize, we don't have time for any more questions, but feel free I can, to uh, do any version to put them in the chat. And I can yeah, answer so. some questions in the chat. Perfect, thank you so much. And also her email is um, in, in the agenda. Yep. So you can feel free to reach out. Um, I will now turn it over uh, to our next speaker. So um, I have the honor of introducing Stephen. Uh, so Steve um, is Chief of Public Affairs for the Army Corps of Engineers in the Philadelphia District. He has served with the Army Corps for the past 13 years and has been involved with a variety of water resources projects in the Mid-Atlantic region, including coastal storm risk management studies and projects, dredging and beneficial use projects and environmental restoration activities. And so he's here to talk about the evolution of dredged sediments in New Jersey. So welcome, Steve. Great, thank you. Thank you, Melanie. And I can definitely relate to the binders that uh, we just saw. The Corps of Engineers is known for our 500 page reports, but I'll try to be more brief than that. Um, thank you for having me. Um, this is an honor to be here. Um, this is a really important topic for the Corps of Engineers. Um, let's see here. I want to first acknowledge Monica Chapin, some of you may know her, she's a leader in our district, really leads this program and has brought a bunch of people in, into this, and I really want to acknowledge her leadership. Um, she's been a tremendous resource to our district. Um, this is an important topic for us because um, Hurricane Sandy happened 10 years ago, um, just at the anniversary, and for our district that really sort of changed the paradigm um, for us, so it's really interesting to look back 10 years later at this point. So it's a quick agenda. Um, I'll kind of start with a little introduction, give a little national context about why it's an important topic for the Corps of Engineers. I'll give a couple of project examples for us in the Mid-Atlantic, um, Mordecai Island, New Jersey, and our Seven Mile Island Innovation Lab. And then I'll kind of talk a little bit about our overall approach with this program, touch on some lessons learned, and then if there's any time for questions, take those. Okay, so a little national context here. Um, navigation is the Corps' oldest mission. We've been doing it since the 1820s. Um, and with that, over the years, we have thousands of miles of channels that we now maintain. And those run the gamut from huge mega ports like the Port of Long Beach, um, container ports, to small subsistence fishing harbors. So it's a really important part of our national economy. Um, and the way we maintain channels, uh, for the most part, um, is through surveying and dredging. So we have a fleet of hydrographic survey vessels that variety of Army Corps districts around the country, taking those soundings, getting that data to mariners for safe navigation. And then when we need to, um, when there's funding, we dredge. Um, and so that's the primary way we're maintaining these channels and working closely with the U.S. Coast Guard as we do that. Um, I put up this picture, I find it pretty striking. So the photo on the left is from 1912, the American Dredging Company in New Jersey. The photo on the right is from last week at Wilmington Harbor um, in Delaware. They look pretty similar, right? Um, and I put that up there because the fundamental principles of dredging haven't really changed that much. Um, of course, the pumps have improved, technology's improved, but um, the Corps of Engineers has been doing this kind of work since the 1800s. Um, so that part hasn't really changed, but what is changing and evolving is what we do with the sediment after we dredge, and then also the value that we put on the sediment um, as well is also changing and continues to evolve. So every year, the Army Corps of Engineers dredges about, on average, 220 million cubic yards of sediment. Um, and the Chief of Engineers, Lieutenant General Spellman, has identified a goal to use 70% of that sediment beneficially by 2030. We're about halfway there now. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and that work will be done by Army Corps districts, 
the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center, which plays a key role in this in terms of the R&D side, and others. Um, and the quote up here, this sort of was put to us by Dr. Lenore Tedesco. She's the executive director of the Wetlands Institute in, just outside of Stone Harbor, New Jersey, and has been a key partner and leader on this for us. She kind of put it this way to us. Sediment is the current sea of salt marsh ecosystems. And then the Corps of Engineers, you guys, are perhaps the largest sediment brokers just by nature of that navigation mission. You're handling this much sediment every year. So then the key question ultimately comes down to how do we be the best stewards of that sediment that we're handling given what we know about salt marsh and other ecosystems? Uh, organizational perspective. So our district, we cover parts of five states. Um, we cover about 500 miles of channels, including the Delaware River and Bay. That's where we do the majority of our work. Um, but the, the project I'm going to focus on today is the New Jersey Intracoastal Waterway, which you can see on the right side of that map. Um, it's 117 miles that connects coastal inlets, um, a very significant fishing industry, I believe the fifth or sixth largest in the nation, and a whole lot of recreational boating as well. And ultimately, when the, the sediment that we dredge is clean, we're trying to find opportunities to use 100% beneficially. Moving towards that has been a real evolution over the years. Um, before the Clean Water Act, dredge sediment was typically placed where it was convenient, usually pretty close. Um, sometimes it did good things, sometimes it didn't do good things. Um, then after the Clean Water Act, it was more often put in confined disposal facilities, which I'll touch on in a minute. But today, since Hurricane Sandy, we're really moving towards a place where we're trying to um, be really responsible and good stewards of that sediment, like I said. And as I mentioned with Hurricane Sandy, um, it was a real paradigm shift for our organization because the, the waterway had significant shoaling, of course, from the storm. So we had the money to dredge, but very limited places to put it. And we had the belief and the understanding that the sediment would be a resource for good. Um, and so that really started to change things. And now I'll touch on Mordecai Island. So as you can see here, the intercoastal waterways on the left side there, right, right near Mordecai Island, which had an eroded section in the middle. It was an important island for habitat, for coastal resilience, for the backside of Long Beach Island. Um, and you can see on the top of that image is a place called Parker's Island. That's a confined disposal facility. Um, wish I had a different image because it looks basically like a landfill on the marsh. Diked up, um, trapped sediment for years, put sediment there. Um, and so historically, that's where sediment from that part of the waterway was placed. Uh, of course, we wanted to place it um, where, uh, right where you can see on the bottom image there, but it took about two years to get the permits to do that. Um, and this project kind of really started to change things for us um, from that perspective and sort of creating some momentum for us. Um, but it's a 45 acre uninhabited coastal salt marsh island, important for habitat, and it's important to uh, reduce fetch and wave energy on the pretty expansive Barnegat Bay. As you can see in the image, that's the backside of Long Beach Island. Uh, Beach Haven, New Jersey specifically. So ultimately what we did was we placed 25,000 cubic yards of sediment um, from a key shoal in the channel right in that area in the middle in the eroded section. And on the right side you can see the historic um, shoreline positions for Mordecai. So planting and adaptive management, and that's a common theme for us, the idea that we're not just coming to an area once and doing a project, we're monitoring it, we, we may come back, we may have to change our approach. Um, that's been a key theme for this entire program for our district. But we planted uh, different varieties of marsh grass based on the topography. Um, we realized we needed to go back in 2017, did that. Um, and throughout that process, we relied on partners. NOAA, um, US BIRDIC stands for Engineer Research and Development Center. It's a part of the Army. Um, and then also the Mordecai Island Land Trust. And this project for us is a pretty good example of kind of parallel paths and multi pronged approach. So even within the Corps of Engineers, you have different sort of business lines and organizations. Our operations division um, that manages the waterway there, they're able to do things relatively quickly, dredge the waterway, design a beneficial use project. Um, but we have other sides where we do planning studies, and those take a little bit longer. So they, they're actually engaged in an effort right now to look at placing a rubble mound breakwater and backfilling material um, behind it. And then there's also nonprofit activities that are going on as well. Um, in, in the area to sort of help fortify the island. So sort of parallel path, multiple activities, all trying to serve the same purpose. Um, this is a good example of that. 
And the other project I want to touch on is the Seven Mile Island Innovation Lab. Um, so what is it? Um, it's an initiative. Uh, it's not a physical place or anything like that, but it's a, it's a partnership with all the partners there on the bottom, the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center, the state of New Jersey, New Jersey DEP, New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife, the Wetlands Institute, and of course the Army Corps Philadelphia District. Why did we pick this area? Um, well, as you can see in the map, the intracoastal waterway meanders through this area um, with a few areas that chronically show over the years. So we have to dredge there, that's, that's a given. Um, and we have salt marsh owned by the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife that's drowning um, and really struggling to keep up with sea level rise. We have historic placement sites where in the past, the Corps of Engineers, usually before the Clean Water Act, placed material. Um, and so we have a good sort of comparison mechanism. And we have the Wetlands Institute, which is located right in the middle of this area. Um, and they've been a tremendous partner and resource and provide a ton of expertise for us. So that's why we picked this location. It's based on a Dutch concept to sort of test um, projects to advance the practice of beneficial use. Here's a picture from our first meeting. That's actually from the Wetlands Institute. Um, the we launched it in April of 2019, but the initiative has really grown over the years. We have, uh, I believe, 30 scientists working on snow. We call it snow. Um, 50 working group members um, representing federal agencies, state agencies, academia including nearby Boston College. Um, so it's really grown. Um, and the Corps of Engineers knows we can't do these things alone. We really need expertise of others. And that's kind of one of the strengths of the organization that we built. And so what have we done? Um, a couple <laughs> projects. There's some projects that happened before we formally launched this mill. Um, and there's some that have happened after and continue on now. Um, but I'll just touch on a couple. Um, Essentially, as I mentioned, as Lenore Tedesco puts it, the status quo was really unacceptable. You had sort of drowning marsh, salt marsh, um, and a lack of habitat. And, and in this area, there are significant colonial nesting birds and wading birds that use the marsh. Um, and the historic placement sites uh, that I mentioned earlier were some of the only suitable habitat left um, for, for different bird species. So for Great Flats and Ring Island, and the picture you can see there on the right side is from uh, Great Flats. We created, we used, and we had mostly sandy material for those first two projects. So we basically created nesting habitat, sort of elevating, um, as you can see on the, the um, image on the right there as well, basically created an elevated habitat for those species. We've done multiple placements for those with monitoring, um, and the Wetlands Institute has seen some real signs of success in terms of the colonial nesting bird population. So that's sort of the first two that I'll mention. Um, the latter two, Gullen surgeon a little bit different because we had a mix of uh, sandy, uh, sand and uh, fine grain sediment. And again, the historic placement sites were some of the only suitable habitat for wading bird species. And I believe 25% of the wading bird species in New Jersey nest on those two islands there. Um, so essentially what we tried to do was to use unconfined placement um, and using sort of the contours of the island, currents, um, and sort of the other contours to basically try to have target elevations um, and use a sediment distribution site that basically had what we call a Y valve. Wish I had a picture of that right now, but um, with, a, with sort of spraying technology so we could kind of disperse sediment over a larger area. Um, we're still in the process of developing the lessons learned from that effort, um, but so far um, we continue to go back to it. Um, and again, it's one of those things where we're going to continue to monitor it and perhaps do additional placements in the future. So just a quick note here about, I guess, our overall approach with all these projects. Um, the Innovation Lab, and in general, it's about practical application. So trying things, um, improving each time, um, sort of managing risk. We understand there is risk, but just managing it to the best of our ability and to adapt. Um, as part of that, we have to characterize the sediment characteristics early. Um, and we do that, um, just to sort of we're really seeking to match and balance our need to dredge with what the nearby ecological um, concerns are. And that's really where the Wetlands Institute and the state of New Jersey play a key role in helping us do that. Um, and as you saw with the intracoastal water and meandering right through, there's plenty of opportunities to dredge. So the challenge is characterizing the sediment and then seeing what good we can do with it nearby. Um, next point, um, using both the government dredging plant and private industry. So 
the federal government owns and operates dredges. Um, some of them are appropriate for this kind of work. Um, there's four based in Wilmington, North Carolina that we've used on not these projects, but perhaps similar ones. And then also working with private industry. So we have a great contractor that's done a lot of this work, um, Barney at Bay Dredging Company. Um, and so working through processes with them to sort of match um, trial and error um, and, and things like that. So really working closely with them. These projects have to be buildable and practical. And that's, that's been an important point of our effort. And also not over-engineering things um, and making sure we have something that is practical and, and, and workable for contractors. Um, leveraging expertise of partners has been a key role. Um, like I said, we have 30 scientists working on the innovation lab, 50 working group members, um, and finding ways in which each party can sort of help us get to a place where we can build projects. Sharing knowledge and lessons learned. So we have about two uh, work group meetings every year as part of the innovation lab, and sort of that's where we bring we, we, we got disrupted because of COVID, but we used to bring partners to the wetlands and soup, which is inspiring, I think, because it's right in the middle of the area where we're working. So you look out, see the marsh, um, and so I think that, that played a key role. We're getting back to that point now. Um, we've had some virtual meetings as well. And then the last point I want to touch on is the Corps of Engineers has a program called Engineering with Nature. Um, our district became a recruiting ground for this. Um, but the majority of our work has been sort of in the coastal dredging and beneficial use world. But the Corps of Engineers has a huge mission with dams, bridges, ecosystem projects, um, riverine projects. And so we're trying to think about ways in which we can sort of take this mindset and perhaps expand it to our other missions um, and finding opportunities to do that. Um, the link on the bottom there, um, I don't know if that can be put in the chat, but that's our webpage for this program. We have some fact sheets and white papers on there that are available for anyone. Um, and I put this up there, just um, these are different publications and podcasts um, about sort of our program that, that mentioned some of our work. But it's funny, like a, a decade ago, I would have been surprised if someone said there would be podcasts about Dredge 7. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there are. And um, it's pretty exciting and inspiring, I think. Um, but with that, we acknowledge, I guess, that there's op tremendous opportunity, right? If there, people are talking about it, people are excited about it, like the official, I mean, it's, a, it's really exploded, um, but there's also some risks, right? Um, if, if a project that perhaps shouldn't be built uh, moves forward, it can set other things back, right? And I think our district tries to manage that risk um, with um, sort of a multi pronged approach. The main thing is to educate stakeholders about what's buildable for contractors, um, sediment characteristics, and other things like that. So you try to manage it with education, um, and that's all part of it. And that's my last slide. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before our networking break, I think we'd like to take at least one question from the audience. Oh, we have a question right here in the... Hi, uh, great presentation. My name is Devin McGee. I'm with Arcadis. Um, a lot of the conversation with Nature-based solutions is around the coastal environment. I think the vast majority of the presentations are today. So I was really interested in the slide you had about um, kind of moving beyond dredging. So I guess from your perspective, what do you think the biggest opportunity is for nature-based solutions that are not coastal? That's a great that like the question. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, we try to bring people into some of these sort of forums that that may not be tied into this kind of stuff. Like we have dam operators that are managing thousands of acres of property at a, at a federal dam, and they may not be sort of tied into this kind of stuff. And so we try to sort of educate, share information in our organization. Um, but there's a lot of momentum. There's a lot of discussion um, that we've heard from higher levels with the core, with Congress. So there's opportunities. I don't know if I could pinpoint one sort of area per se, but um, I guess sharing information and knowledge and getting the information out there is probably the best way we've found to try to start the conversation in different areas, sort of like you said, outside of the coastal dredging sort of world. All right. I think we will now move on to the networking break. So we'll be back with you all at 1040. Feel free to grab snacks, coffee. Uh, Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Leah Feldman. Um, as uh, as you mentioned, I'm a coastal policy analyst for the Coastal Resources Management Council. I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to be talking to you all a little bit about a living shoreline project uh, that is in Rose Larissa Park in East Providence, Rhode Island. 
Um, this project was a joint venture between the CRMC, my organization, the Coastal Resource Management Council, the City of East Providence, the Nature Conservancy, NOAA, and uh, Love Power Racing, uh, with some on the ground assistance from GCA and some fellow engineers. So, just to give you a bit of an overview for the next 15 minutes, um, I'm going to be walking you through several elements of the project. Um, I'll walk you through the site location, which is Rose Larissa Park, also known as Crescent Point, or Crescent Park, Bullock's Point, um, or just Rose Larissa. Um, then I'll get an overview of each of the agencies and what their roles were in the project. Uh, and then I'm going to get into the meat of the project itself. Um, this project was a hybrid project design, meaning it was split into two uh, phases of hard and soft construction. Um, so each element, um, each element I'll explain in a little bit more detail later. Um, then I'm going to provide an over overview of the landscape of uh, Living Shoreline Project in Rhode Island uh, writ large. Um, and then uh, finally just finish up by explaining the importance of monitoring um, in plans like this in short Living Shoreline Project overall. Uh, so, to begin, I'm going to start with an overview of the site location for this Living Shoreline project. Uh, Rose Larissa Park is located in the Riverside section of East Providence, Rhode Island. The site um, is comprised of fairly high bluffs, um, which consists of glacial deposits, primarily sand, um, as the previous dimension mentioned. Um, the bluffs are fronted by uh, a narrow, quite narrow, intertidal beach. Um, the remnants of various other shoreline protection efforts uh, include some collapsed seawalls um, and uh, wooden bulkheads and riprap that are a large portion of the beach. Um, erosion in the park is a big problem, well, erosion in particular, uh, and the surrounding neighborhood threatens uh, dozens of residential properties on the area. Uh, and in addition to a rather large and vibrant public recreation area. Both. So um, this is a previous location of a pretty uh, interesting historic spot that is formerly known as Crescent Park, uh, which was known to some as the Coney Island of New England, which I found fascinating because I'm from Coney Island, the original one in Brooklyn. Um, uh, this uh, came to apply, the Coney Island of New England came to apply in the early 1900s. Uh, during its heyday, uh, this was a really large summer recreation area. Um, the amusement park had a dance hall and a gigantic midway and bathing houses right on the beach, um, shore facilities and band concerts. It was over 600 acres large, um, and it was quoted in the Providence Journal as the uh, largest and most beautiful seashore pleasure park on the Atlantic coast. Um, it was damaged severely by hurricanes, um, namely in you know, the 1938 hurricane that damaged a lot of Rhode Island shoreline, and then uh, the hurricane in 1954. And the land was eventually sold in 1979, um, though there is a re remaining carousel on the property, which is the original uh, Charles Woods carousel, which was staged and remains there to this day. That was just a fun aside. I had to include it. So to go back to the uh, meat of the matter, um, the agencies involved in this project, uh, this is a fairly self-explanatory slide, but um, you know, each of these agencies uh, really play a large role. This is a very dynamic project involving a lot of different people um, and partners. So uh, the Nature Conservancy, the Rhode Island Coastal Management, Coastal Resource Management Council, and the City of East Providence um, all received funding from NOAA's Coastal Resilience Grants um, to increase the coastal resilience and reduce risk to the people, infrastructure, and natural resources in coastal communities by uh, building and monitoring nature-based coastal resilience efforts um, throughout New England. Uh, the federal grants that we received were bolstered by, uh, as I mentioned, uh, grants through the Rhode Island State Government, through the uh, Coastal and Estuary Restoration Habitat Trust Fund, um, and from an, a fellow of the group called the Lentower Racing, which I mentioned earlier. Oh, and then of course, now on the groundwork from Sunco. Contracting as well and engineering from GPA. So, just to go over the project a little bit, um, this was a two phase project. So, um, there was an intertidal sill that was uh, constructed, and then also a bluff treatment across uh, the northern and southern areas of the park. 
So um, this is, again, a little bit of an overview of the two segments. So each of the intertidal sills that were constructed, uh, they cover 130 lateral feet of the shoreline and 1,740 square feet of shoreline in general. Um, each sill was 15 feet wide at the base and 3 feet wide at the crest. Um, the sills were constructed using 125 uh, cubic yards of armor stone and 62 cubic yards of small stone. Uh, so in order to construct the sill, excavation and grading were undertaken over a 2,000 square foot area. Um, the final elevation of the sill is approximately 2.5 feet uh, in that VA. So these are just some um, images of the installation phase um, of the intertidal sill from May 2020 uh, when this project began. Um, through present day, uh, so you can see some of the tidal ranges that are being replaced there. Um, this was after the growing season began, after the plantings were planted, um, they started to take off, and then you can see what it looks like present day. These were taken on Tuesday. So phase two of the project uh, was a bluff treatment, um, which consists of 80 cubic yards of salt marsh substrate that all placed over a 4,000 square foot area of a little bit landward of the silt in order to provide a terrace for the planting. Um, planting area was also covered with uh, core logs, core fabric, and burlap to reduce scour and erosion. And then also sandbags were used um, in order to protect the species and cover uh, an over 130 foot area. Um, again, just some more photos. This is an example of the seawalls that you will see later. Uh, the project spans a 5,500 square foot area below the high tide line at the beach uh, and includes uh, plantings of Spartina alternaflora and Dicillus bicata plugs. Finally, two uh, photo monitoring stations were in place as well for the monitoring aspect of the project. Um, so these are those core logs going in. These are the, the foot with the uh, stones placed. Um, this is August. You can sort of see as the photos go on that seawall sort of starting to crumble and fail, which it eventually did. Uh, and this is present day. So this is a pretty good image of where you can see the project ending and the existing uh, eroding bluff uh, beside it. So one of the reasons this location was chosen is because there are various uh, mitigation efforts in place, including gray infrastructure that um, pretty dramatically failed <laughs> um, after the installation of the Living Shoreline project. This concrete wall actually fell in the middle of the night. Um, didn't hurt anybody, but uh, it posed a pretty significant risk to recreational users. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so the main goals of this project were to demonstrate the effectiveness of nature-based uh, coastal infrastructure and to increase coastal resilience um, and reduce risk to people and infrastructure. Uh, people and infrastructure, as I mentioned, pretty dramatically, <laughs> um, and to develop uh, transferable <laughs> shoreline treatments uh, that utilize uh, native vegetation uh, and biodegradable materials to control erosion while also enhancing the area, uh, both for use and for uh, resources and habitat, and additionally to educate the public. Um, I do most of the monitoring for this project, so I'm down there uh, once or twice a month, depending on how nice the weather is. Um, and I really enjoy getting to talk to the people who live in the area and who use the site. Um, it is an incredibly easy way to demonstrate uh, the types of, you know, future erosion mitigation uh, examples in the state um, because there is a breadth of resilience measures that exist in this one, you know, one recreational area. So, um, as I mentioned, the main project objectives were to design and build non-structural hybrid erosion control treatment uh, and an intercidal tidal sill. Uh, in order to establish conditions conducive to salt marsh vegetation growth, um, and also just to evaluate the effectiveness of an intertidal fill and loss treatment, um, and to document uh, both the successes uh, and failures, should there be some, as well as the cost of installing and maintaining a nature based uh, solution against you know, more traditional hardwood structures. Um, of course, you know, avoidance and mitigation are part of you know, any good project plan. Um, and also part of the sort of regulatory landscape uh, in Rhode Island. So grading over the entire area took place in order to, you know, limit the amount of fill that was needed um, and establish a flat surface. Uh, work was completed at low tide in order to uh, limit, you know, turbidity in the water. Um, 
and then you know the concrete that was removed from the area uh, was uh, disposed of at a legal offsite location uh, in order to offset the fill placement in, in the intertidal area. So um, there's definitely an interest in the state um, in natural and nature-based solutions for shoreline erosion mitigation um, in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, so a staff report that was, that was done at the same time of this project installation indicated that um, within one mile area of this park, uh, there were 47 applications for a shoreline uh, protection project. Um, and at the time, uh, only one of them, but one of them, was for a non-structural treatment. Um, there have been more requests of that nature since 2020. Um, our, the Coastal Resource Management Council outlines quite specifically in our policy a preference for natural and nature-based shoreline mitigation efforts. Um, and firms offering this kind of engineering are certainly growing in both uh, their capacity to offer kind of, uh, mitigation efforts of this nature um, and so interest in them. Um, so as I mentioned, monitoring is extremely important for a project of this scale. Um, there is a five-year monitoring project in place, um, which I am doing. Um, I mentioned there were some photo uh, still, or, you know, posts implanted using RTK GPS in order to plant put them in the exact right spot. Um, so photos are taken in order to uh, do some uh, vegetation monitoring and documentation, um, inspection, uh, in control area. Vegetation surface surveys are completed annually during the peak growth season, um, which is August to September, um, and vegetation monitoring surveys uh, consist of percentage cover by uh, vegetation type and overall canopy height uh, with within four fixed uh, vegetation plots. Um, that is all I have for you today. I guess we're saving questions for you. Thank you, Leah. That was very interesting. Um, <clears throat> and there you go. ask questions. So we'll move right on to Allison Bowden. Uh, Allison Bowden is Director of Science and Strategy at the Nature Conservancy. Um, she's a conservation leader and innovator who works across boundaries to develop and implement strategic initiatives to protect healthy rivers, estuaries, and oceans, and the benefits they provide to people, including clean water, climate resilience, and sustainable seafood. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, and I'm so glad to see so many people out for this important topic, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of the conversation, um, and also acknowledge my co-authors on this talk. So, Teresa Davenport was a PhD student uh, at Northeastern University who worked with my team for about nine months last year. Uh, she's moved on to a postdoc at Louisiana State. Uh, and Steve Kirk is the Coastal Program Director on my team and the overall project manager for some of the work that I'm going to talk about. So first, uh, just a little bit of context on the, the Nature Conservancy and how we come to this topic. Uh, so we work in all 50 states and about 70 countries around the world. And we work to build a world where people and nature thrive. So all 4,000 of us around the world are working toward these five goals to tackle climate change and build healthy oceans, fresh water, and land. Uh, so the, the most relevant of those goals to this conversation, uh, we want to protect 10% of ocean area uh, by 2030 and protect 100 million, of, 100 million people on the front lines of climate change uh, help them benefit from nature-based solutions. So those two things combined, um, we focus on both protecting nature and for all the values that it provides to people. So protecting salt marshes, um, innovations like uh, putting insurance on coral reefs and mangroves, um, all the way to much more engineered solutions like we're talking about today. So the, the focus of this talk uh, is on living shorelines, a nature-based solution that is quite highly engineered, as I'm sure you all know. So I'm going to focus on the project that Teresa did, um, which is regulatory challenges, so the, the title of the talk, but also explain a little bit about the larger context for this work. Oh, 
um, jump back for a second. Um, all of the products from the whole product are available um, at that barcode, and uh, you'll all have access to, to these materials after, so don't worry about documenting at all. Uh, but there are a lot of parts to this, to this project, a lot of partners, um, and a lot of years. So um, a lot of context that I won't be talking about in depth, but it's all available. Um, and Jason did a great job of talking about why this issue is important. Um, and of course, you're here, and you already know, so I won't take up your time with that. Um, coastal squeeze is a pretty big problem. Uh, you know, Jason talked about how much of the, the south coast is hardened. Um, Boston has one of the most hardened shorelines in the country, uh, per a paper by Rachel, led by Rachel Gitman. Uh, out of East Carolina University. So we have a very hardened shore. Um, we also have about 80,000 people who work in the seafood industry. We have some really important habitats. Um, so this is a, a really important issue in New England. And we found, uh, going back to the, the first report in the series in 2017, that even though we think living shorelines are a really for, important opportunity, um, ways to address coastal hazards while uh, protecting a dynamic land water interface, we really need to do that. Uh, there's hardly any practice of living shorelines in New England. So what, why is that and what are we going to do about it? And part of the explanation um, is that Clean Water Act really is designed to keep us out of the regulated resource. Um, the, the primary federal law that regulates living shorelines, um, we want to avoid, minimize, mitigate. That's all a great idea going back to the 1960s and 70s when that law was being written. Pretty much everything in our environmental protection mindset is to have people stay out of the regulated resource. That makes a lot of sense, particularly when you're talking about development, which is really what those people were imagining. I'm a restoration ecologist. I've spent a good part of my 21 years at TNC working on figuring out how to get the regulatory environment to let us do things like dam removal and salt marsh restoration and culvert upgrades. Um, so this is sort of the, the next line um, in, in that. And it takes a, a lot of conversation uh, and a lot of science. So we looked at what are some of the drivers of, in the, the system. Um, there aren't a lot of examples in the region, so they're unfamiliar. There's um, skepticism about how living shorelines can work in a place where we have short growing seasons, we have ice in the winter, and we have a really big tide range. A lot of the other places in the country where they're more typical have much milder conditions. One foot tide, no ice. Um, so people are like, eh, they probably won't work here. Because there's all that skepticism, there's not a lot of demand. And there's not a lot of demand, so there's not a lot of suppliers. Um, there aren't a lot of projects, and so we don't have a lot of data about performance. And the question that Teresa asked in her project with us, what role does a challenging regulatory environment play? So the next few things I'm going to talk about um, are um, what we did, or what, what Teresa focused on, was to document the permitting experiences in the project, um, actually write down all in one place for all of New England what the regulatory requirements are, at the state, regional, and federal level, um, and to write the report, uh, synthesize the challenges and opportunities for us to move forward. So just quickly, um, the larger project uh, that was completed in the winter of 2022, or yeah, earlier this year, almost a year ago, um, for about five years, we worked with 15 partners in all the coastal states in New England, um, put 15 projects on the ground, developed a shared monitoring document, and are monitoring those projects, um, and then this product also was part of that. So the project that Leah just talked about at Rose Larissa Park, uh, Rose Larissa Park was our project. Rhode Island. So that's how these pieces fit together. So I just mentioned what Teresa's objectives were. So this was 
one of the deliverables for our five-year project. Um, so one thing to note, which many of you probably know, there is a nationwide permit for living shorelines, but we're in New England and we don't use the nationwide permit because we're not part of the nation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have state-by-state -state approach to permitting. Um, even though it's a federal permit, we do it state-by-state. -state. So that's interesting. Um, there are, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just a, a thing to know and, and be responsive to. Um, as Leah mentioned, uh, Rhode Island has regulatory preferences for living shorelines. All of the New England states have some form of regulatory preference for living shorelines. All of their policies talk about considering sea level rise. Everybody that Teresa interviewed in the process uh, had a high level of familiarity. So in every state, we were, the uh, Coastal Zone Management Agency and other state agencies were very closely involved in the project. So these were not people who were unfamiliar with the permitting environment. Uh, and the challenges uh, that were identified, that obviously there were a fair number, but there were some common threads. And uh, a key common thread was um, actually related to the federal regulatory process uh, which operates through the Army Corps of Engineers. So the first challenge, um, as I mentioned earlier, are the, the processes, basically our regulatory environment was created to be reactive to development proposals. It wasn't really set up for restoration. We've made a lot of progress on getting restoration to be built into the system, and so we just need to continue that progress as we think about living shorelines. So the strict resource avoidance where we have a preference for staying above mean high water, um, makes it easier to do things above mean high water. If you want to build a short living shoreline, you got to do it in the inch of tidal zone. Five minutes, thank you. Uh, there's no design standard, at least not in New England. So if you are a permit reviewer and there's a design standard, it's pretty easy to see whether a project meets the design standard. There's no design standard. You have to have a lot of conversations with the project team. You have to ask for more data. You have to ask a lot of questions. That takes a lot of time. And there's only so many reviewers. And there's only so many project staff. So that is a barrier. It also leads to lack of consistency in project review. So the opportunity with that um, that we can document the cumulative impacts of people working above uh, and below uh, the regulated area, um, we can enhance review consistency by establishing design standards, ideally, um, and documenting our experiences through these different projects and building shared understanding of trade-offs. Uh, and we can hire more people. <laughs> um, and this is something that TNC does a lot of in our um, federal and state level advocacy is acknowledge that work is done by people, and if we want good project reviews, uh, we need to support people in doing that. Um, so the next challenge is that um, future conditions are not really built in to the review process. When we look, basically we're talking about what is there today and how do we protect what's there today. But if we really focus on avoidance and trying to protect what's there today, we're sort of dooming the habitat that's seaward of whatever our treatment is, because we know that sea level rise is coming, um, and I won't talk more about that because Jason did a good job of that. So we really need to document and think about trade-offs. What, what impact will what we do today have on the future condition of the site and not just on the current condition? And so that's our opportunity, um, is to really think about those things and uh, develop agreements for what those mean, and be really explicit, explicit about the trade-offs that we're making, because really that's all we have, is trade-offs. We can't really keep what we have over time. So uh, this takes me to the end of Teresa's report uh, through last winter, where we concluded that challenging regulatory environment does matter, um, 
the other pieces matter as well. And so we need to have a lot more conversation. Um, we have the documentation now of the performance of those 15 sites, at least up to this point. We need to build that back into the conversation with regulators. So that takes me forward to today. Um, so at the fall meeting, Northeast Regional Ocean Council, uh, Julia Nigel from Mass Museum presented these two slides that I'm going to show. Um, so I'm a member of the Coastal Hazards Committee. And the next step to continue to advance this work is to basically to keep the conversation going and to bring more people into it. Uh, so we want to host a forum on regulatory challenges and opportunities, um, host a workshop on climate change impacts and the potential for habitat conversion, uh, really thinking about trade-offs. You know, is habitat conversion always bad? Or can we make rational trade-offs? Uh, bring the data from these projects back into the story and talk to people about it. And so we are working um, with NROC on developing a scope of work um, for some funding, another round of funding to come to TMC um, and talking about um, refining regulatory guidance. This is all still uh, sort of the details uh, to be determined. We're, we're in conversation now, um, but definitely we'll be hosting a number of forums um, that I think many of you will be interested to attend um, and really trying to, again, build the conversation. I know there's a lot of regulators in the room. No criticism of any kind of anyone is, is intended. This stuff is hard. And um, the important thing to do is to really look at the, the information and, and build a new conversation about how we're going to address the challenges that are happening. Thank you. I look forward to the panel. I'd like to invite all the uh, speakers in the session up to the front here. Thanks, everyone. Um, I know there's going to be a lot of audience questions, so I'll just start and kick it off. Uh, I'll also offer you guys, if there's time and opportunity to ask questions of each other. Uh, but I wanted to start off with kind of a general question. Um, kind of what, what are some of the biggest misconceptions about um, nature-based adaptation strategies that you think are important to dismount? Do we want to like? Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So I think one of the um, misconceptions is that nature-based solutions are not viable because they require maintenance. And I think the misperception there is that. Um, there's there's a there's a perception that hard engineering structures do not require maintenance, and there and therefore it is better to have something that does not require maintenance over something that does. But the fact of the matter is, for anyone who has been involved with um, with these structures, is that the hard structures do indeed require maintenance. They require repair. They require upkeep. Um, so I think that there's almost sort of a false dichotomy between the two. Yeah, oops, sorry, <laughs> too close. Uh, I think that that's a great point, and that I touched on it um, in my introduction. The the notion that nature is sort of not up to the task of dealing with the ocean, um, with short growing season, uh, with a big tide range, with ice, and I'm an ecologist. I've studied coastal systems my whole career, and the notion that a salt marsh that's been there for 6,000 years through every hurricane and every nor'easter and everything else that has, that has happened in that 6,000 years is less resilient than a wall is kind of nuts. Like, does anybody think that a seawall is going to have a 6,000 year design life? I, I don't think so. And so that's why I mentioned, uh, you know, sort of in my TNC context, that really documenting the services and performance of natural systems is so important. So um, another uh, postdoc uh, and other collaborators and I published a paper uh, about a year ago on the performance of salt marshes and Hurricane Michael, uh, the only 
for the first Category 5 hurricane to make landfall in the U.S. in about 30 years, and pretty much no gray infrastructure survived that. Two percent of the salt marshes in the study area were damaged. So that's a pretty impressive performance on the part of nature. And that's what we want to translate into these more uh, engineered solutions that nature and natural processes know how to stand up to nature. And we need to learn from them and how to mimic those processes to help protect us uh, as the climate changes. Um, yeah, just kind of going to echo what Jason and Allison said. They, they, you know, the example I gave, my the project in, in Rhode Island, um, as I mentioned, and I think I included a picture. I might not have, but um, that seawall I re referred to, the big concrete seawall, did fall, um, and after it fell, there were you know thousands and thousands of dollars that were dedicated to removing it and making sure that um, you know something, uh, you know, the, the coastal wall didn't just fall into the ground and. You know, the, the salt marsh that we installed as it was a shoreline project, um, part of the reason why we were very confident about its success is because all the way in the northern end of the beach, um, there was an existing tiny little salt marsh that had occurred naturally there. And the bluff behind that salt marsh was much more stable and much more integrated than the areas that didn't have the salt marsh in front of it, that were fortified by concrete structures. Um, so we just have this really incredible gem of like a case study of the success of uh, you know, salt marshes, whether they occurred naturally or were helped along by the nature conservancy. Um, it's just a, it's a pretty stark example of the success that's possible. And we have to work really hard to educate people that maintenance doesn't mean failure. Uh, we have a significant program where we build dune projects, beach projects, projects I mentioned earlier, and getting that understanding is very difficult and challenging. Um, that maintenance, you know, is, is not necessarily mean the project failed. It just means we're adapting um, over time. Um, Allison uh, noted that there's a small pipeline of, of projects or limited experience. Jason pointed to a number of projects in the area um, and also in Rhode Island as well. Um, what advice would you give to um, communities, nonprofits, landowners, private or public? Um, to help move that along? What are the early steps that communities and other landowners should be taking now? I heard get the science, invest in science, I heard partnership, but um, anything you want to add or expand on? No. <laughs> sure. Um, I think one of the things do is to just be able to point to simply other projects because we're still relatively early in the development of these nature-based solutions. And I think there is a natural tendency for the public at large to revert back to what they know and what they're or what they're familiar with. And again, these are the harder structures. So the more we can have venues like this where we're presenting where these projects are happening and being successful, it's proof of concept and nobody wants to be the first. So when you get more of these projects going and you can point to these successes to other communities, I think that is, is um, a very strong teaching tool for motivation. I also think having grants available to help do these things is also a game changer. Just Speaking specifically for my office, um, we were long advocates of nature-based solutions, um, but we didn't have a mechanism to fund those. Now that we do, it's through the Coast Resilience Grant Program. A lot of the projects that I mentioned, our office has funded through over the course of a number of grant cycles and has taken these projects from conception through construction. And I think being able to facilitate these types of projects, again, not with just dollars, but technical assistance that we bring to the table is also a powerful tool as well. Yeah, I'll pick up again, sorry. <laughs> uh, the importance of technical assistance uh, and shout out to CPM, six of the projects, uh, six of the site-specific projects in the larger projects that I talked about are in Massachusetts. 
um, museum is really um, incredible is in creating the demand uh, and being responsive to that demand and really helping communities think about um, you know what kind of solutions are appropriate for them and how to execute them. So I think sort of building on that, how do we get that um, out into the world, more into the private sector as well? Um, so how do we get, you know, if there are engineering firms, obviously there are engineering firms who put the landowners are gonna hire, uh, can we point people, maybe not so much the public agency, can I play a role in pointing people to some of the firms that have more experience and will be, um, maybe give a more balanced picture to a property owner? Uh, if all you know how to do is build a seawall, you're probably going to sell a seawall to uh, you know whoever rings your phone. So really um, thinking about all those parts, how do we use the experience from all these the public sector projects that have been done uh, bring in the experience from the private sector projects and, and a number of projects designed in CAD and other places uh, and really put those pieces together to advance the field. Yeah, those are both very good answers. I can't. Why you go first? <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, um, I just would echo. <clears throat> Excuse me, both of those concepts. I think um, there's also just to add an additional mis misconception about um, the cost. I'm sorry, <coughs> I should have brought my water up here. Um, the cost of insulation. Um, there have been several studies that have shown that over the long term, maintenance of living shorelines is less costly than uh, hard structures, but there is an initial upfront cost that can scare folks off. Um, so I think just you know matching the proper funding mechanism to projects of the future is important. And as Alice and you both said, that really can't be done without um, some folks who have already successfully done these kinds of things, sort of showing that folks the roads. Um, so bringing in successful you know firms that have done it um, and making oh gosh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think that's the answer. Um, I think um, you know people often don't get to see the benefits of them. Um, some of these projects happen in more remote locations or in the off season when it's cold or maybe it's not favorable to see it. So start trying to get them out to the site or even elected officials and community leaders um, would really help them sort of demonstrate the benefits and sort of educate um, to echo the points that are said. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna turn it back to this eager audience. Um, we'll start with the virtual audience. All right. So the first question we have is from Nick Wong, who asks, what approaches to working with private shoreline landowners to implement NDS are government and are government entities and nonprofits finding to be successful? Yeah, I will start on this one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a really tough question um, and something that we interact with a lot. Um, amazingly, we've had folks private landowners come up to us, actually specifically in the East Providence area, potentially, I don't know, but potentially folks who have seen the Rose Larissa project, um, who are curious off the bat on HBA solutions. I mean, it's rare, certainly, but it's growing more and more frequent um, as time goes on. I think they're becoming sort of popular, just kind of, I, I don't know, this is a guess, but they're pretty, um, and people like pretty things on their property. So, um, you know, Obviously, that comes to a screeching halt when someone is faced with a uh, you know, steep eroding uh, piece of property that's going to fall into the water. They're you know, desperate to keep their house not in the water. Um, and so that might not be the first thing that comes to mind, uh, sort of softer nature based solutions. But I will say that from personal experience, it is growing um, in popularity among residential landowners. Um, in the room, I think there was a hand over here. Um, uh, why don't you go ahead? Oh, actually, yes, yes, of course. Can I skip you since you have a question yeah, for um, uh, Noah? Sure. Thanks. Um, hello. Hi. Uh, Noah Sloan uh, from FLR Consulting. Um, I work with a lot of communities on planning for coastal resilience and over the years have, uh, and one of these case studies with people who have like shied away from uh, anything that involves touching the water because of the permitting challenges and communities like to see projects that happen. 
um, and and the length of time that can go on. Uh, the example project is that again, that's just like they've been trying to build a dune for like 10 years, um, and that gets very frustrating to them. So you, I think, all gave examples of successful projects. Like I'm wondering. What, what's your insight into like how to work through the permitting process and, and how to make these actually happen? I have that, that some communities don't always like to fund lots of studies. So those two things together. Well, um, um, so I, I, um, with regards to the time permitting case, um, are we on there? Oh, I just have to. <laughs> really you mean yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm either that or I just need to learn to project. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, with regards to the permitting timeline, it can be expensive. Um, there are a lot of considerations. Um, the scope of these projects, you're working in a marine environment, um, intertidal in, uh, in, in a lot of cases. A lot of sensitive um, resource areas such as rocky intertidal so it does take a lot of feasibility to make sure that you are proposing a project that makes sense and can either avoid minimize or mitigate the impacts one of the things that we've been very strong advocates of are engaging the environmental review and regulatory community very early in the process as early as you possibly can and get the feedback from the agency staff and work those that feedback into your project design because it's been our experience that that will help facilitate the review of the project farther down the line the only area there on the board here so take that um, my question was, um, so with all this discussion of hard structures and the movement towards living shoreline, has there ever been a process with the incorporation of an existing hard structure since they're all over South Shore, it's displayed in a lot of these presentations, in the collaboration of living shoreline? And is it feasible um, just based on like the foundation not being strong enough? And what type of solution have you seen integrating? I, I can say quickly, uh, so I'm not really a practitioner of living shorelines, but um, the, let's see, the project in Winthrop, the name of which I can't remember right now, Coughlin Park, Coughlin Park <laughs> um, tied in a cobble uh, shoreline to two existing seawalls, if that's the kind of example that you're thinking about. So that's an ultra-urban setting across from the airport um, and a lot of existing hardening in the area and so that is actually a really key consideration it's a great question like we have so much hardening how do you work with that and and around that and so uh, at least that project and possibly some of some of the others are demonstrating that and i mean the uh, rose larissa project also can you know the, the living shoreline is built in a place where the gray infrastructure had already failed. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, and I think it was also like incorporation of nature-based solutions as well with that like hard swimming. There was one study that we had that did look at seawalls. Uh, they didn't end up moving forward, but um, they were looking at sort of texturing seawalls in a way that was sort of better fit for aquatic species. So there was one example I'm aware of, but not anything specific that's actually moved forward with construction, at least in our district. Okay, Bob. Um, from online. So, Andrew, sorry, this is the lab. Andrew Timmons had the next question, and Andrew, you also have your hand up. Would you like to come off mute now? Yeah, I, I'd like to ask a question. It's, uh, it was done in Rhode Island, uh, very successful using dredge material from a project nearby for marsh restoration and, and beneficial use, and, and as well as uh, beach nourishment. Um, uh, the Army Corps uh, had a policy moving forward by 20 uh, that by 2030, uh, almost 70% of their dredge materials need to be used for beneficial use. Uh, so I'm asking the panel what the thoughts are for trying to get some of this work done in uh, Massachusetts to be able to allow utilizing some of this uh, this resource 
uh, which we need to call it that, to be able to help in some of these uh, uh, beach nourishment and hardening projects. Hopefully the influx in federal funds for dredging will actually make you know, more material available for the industry. Yeah, that is a really great question. Um, our office has long been an advocate of beneficial reuse for dredge projects whenever possible. One of the limiting factors to that is you need to make sure that the sediment that is being dredged is compatible with what is going with what is already on the beach, um, because if it's too fine, it simply won't stay. And um, but where where it it can be reused, it it certainly should be, and I think in most cases is. Um, just uh, a couple examples from the South Shore. Um, a, not too long ago, the South River was dredged, and that material was put up on Rexham Beach. Um, there's also a federal navigation dredge project in Green Harbor where they dredge that annually to the tune of, I think, between 20 and 30,000 cubic yards. Um, the Army Corps uses a hopper dredge and um, places that material in the near shore with the idea that um, that material will work its way up onto the beach. Um, as part of the Marshfield Duxbury um, Beach Nourishment Project, which I mentioned, the town is looking to um, coordinate with the core on that dredging because although that dredge volume is not sufficient to do one of those larger dredge projects, it could very conceivably be used as ongoing maintenance material. So again, um, I think the more that we can use dredge material when it's applicable, um, we definitely should be. Can I add quickly to that? So a, a frontier that we haven't crossed in Massachusetts is uh, thinly replacement of dredge material on salt marshes. And as many of you probably know, salt marshes keep up with sea level rise by depositing sediment on their surface. And we've cut off a lot of sediment supplies to marshes with dams and other things. So one potential way of addressing that, which would require a lot of maintenance potentially, is to place sediment on those marshes. and uh, that would be filling, and filling is a challenging thing to do, perhaps rightly so. Uh, and that's, uh, there's another working group um, led by uh, Mass ECAN, Ecosystem Climate Action Network, uh, that is having conversations about that. And um, if all of these things sort of wrap around each other, and it's all the same rules and all the same people. So one of my goals is try to bring those pieces together and really think about what our objectives are in the face of climate change and how um, our regulations can be updated to maintain those protections because we have protections for a reason, um, but also be relevant uh, to the challenges we're facing. Oh, I literally two seconds. I just want to brag on Rhode Island for one second. We have some thin layer deposition projects that have been very successful in Rhode Island. So we can talk about that if you want. Uh, uh, mostly face-to-face, that's not the work. Yeah, moving to that 70% goal, the person asked the question, it's a really tough task. Um, the Army Corps, one of the challenges is when the cost um, to do something beneficial with the sediment or higher, um, that can be sort of problematic. Um, but it is something Army Corps districts are working towards, and it's a big priority, so I say that. Thank you. Uh, if there was one other question on this far side, yeah. I couldn't tell. I just pointed. That's you. <laughs> All right. I actually have a couple of questions. I have no trouble projecting. I guess. Um, we only have time for one, so choose one. Okay. Let's see then. Oh, that's very difficult. I'm going to ask Leah a compound question. Um, my first question is, I heard that you were monitoring for several years, up to five years. Where did the, the funding for the monitoring come from? And then my second question was, do you have any data available for those in layer placement projects that you're looking at? Uh, yes, we do have data for the thin layer placement projects. They're on the CRMC website www.crmc.ri.gov. Um, the monitoring funding um, 
It's just part of my job. I don't think there's a specific funding for monitoring. Um, I, yeah, I just do. That was quick. Let's go yeah. another one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we have to vote on this excellent piece. Anybody agree? That's right. Quick with that. Yeah. 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 Um, hi, so my, oh, I'm Taylor with DHV. Um, my question is for Jason. I noticed that in your slides you were talking about how the dunes were designed to withstand um, the 50 year flood. And I was just wondering if there was specific design considerations like that make them resilient for the 50 year storm. Um, thanks for that question. Um, there are a number of things that go into that, which include the elevation of the, um, of of the dune, um, the volume of the dune, the sloping of the dune, the, the foreshore environment. So there's a lot of things that do go into that, and it takes some pretty um, sophisticated modeling and design in order to be able to come up with that design to meet that protection requirement. So please join me in thanking our panelists. Um, Okay, good morning everyone. Mark Hobson, I'm a water resources engineer with DHV. Um, so I'd just like to throw out a few thank yous for this morning. Uh, first and foremost to my forum co-chairs and the, all the EDC staff, as you can see with this type of hybrid event, there's so many logistics. So thank you for your hard work. Uh, this could not have happened without you. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, when we started planning for today, we really had the goal of uh, highlighting implementation projects both locally and nationally and your presentations were filled with great examples, lessons learned, and uh, really detailing the benefits of nature-based solutions. Uh, so thank you uh, for participating. I'm really excited and I hope others are to uh, incorporate these into my projects. Um, and then finally, thank you to all the attendees. Uh, I'm consistently impressed by the uh, thoughtful questions that everyone uh, produces at each forum. So I do want to mention two future uh, events. So the first one is the March Forum, which is going to be on long governance. Uh, this actually dovetails really nicely with today's discussion and Allison's presentation. Uh, so what are the challenges? Are they perceived or rail challenges? Um, and so that is, I believe, the first Friday in March. Uh, and then Secondly, uh, the Stone Living Lab is holding a conference also on nature-based solutions in urban settings, and that is April 24th to the 26th, and I believe abstracts are open. Uh, you will be getting, hopefully, email soon about that, and go see Melanie for additional questions on that.